second thing we need to talk about our culture, it's this. We need a culture of critique, but not criticism. Critique, not criticism. You say, Chris, those are synonyms. I would argue differently. Let's keep reading. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, he's continuing again with this metaphor, well, you know what? I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that are, we think are less honorable, we treat them with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. He's talking again about the diversity in our midst, but all predicating by this fact that we can so easily say, I don't need you. But God has put all the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but so that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, each part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. See, Paul is trying to point out here that it is so easy for criticism to step into our midst. And criticism does not build a culture of those who are confident and content in the calling that God has given them. Criticism breeds a culture of comparison because that's what criticism is based in. It's me comparing you to a standard that I've created or it's me comparing you to a thing that I think that you should be. That's gonna breed comparison. See, Chris, but I feel like criticism and critique are very similar. Let me see if I can differentiate between the two. Again, look at that first line, right? If we could go back to it. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 21, he says that the eye cannot say to the hand that I don't need you. The eye says to the hand, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need you. That's destructive. And that's one of the differentiations between criticism and critique. Criticism is purposefully destructive. Critique is purposefully constructive. Now, let me, let me pause here and, and make this point. A healthy church should never be a church where there is never any type of disagreement. Let me say it again. A healthy church should never be a church where there is never any type of disagreement. That is to say, disagreement is actually a pathway to healthiness. The problem is when we allow disagreement to turn into division. That's when things get unhealthy. Criticism is purposefully destructive. So it takes disagreement with someone and then it attempts in the midst of a disagreement to destroy the other person. Whereas critique is purposely constructive. It's seeking to build others up. What does this mean on a practical level? It means that we should be a church where at times there is friction. Friction because someone is stepping into your life and calling out an area in you that is not godly. Friction because of a decision that someone makes that is not in line with who they say they are as a follower of Jesus. Friction because someone is here and they're present, but you identify in them and others identify in them that they should be stepping into something that God has for them here. That will only happen maybe through an affirmation conversation that feels at times difficult. Criticism, destructive, critique, constructive, also meaning Someone can critique you, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're trying to personally attack you. How would you know if they are? Well, here's a second differentiation. Criticism is from a human point of view. Critique is from a godly point of view. So the pushback or whatever that you might receive from somebody or you might offer to someone, I would ask, where is the basis of that? Why do you feel that way? Why, why are you thinking that you need to say that to them? Or why did they say that to you, the motive behind it? Is it godly or is it from a human point of view? Last thing, criticism demoralizes 
but critique encourages. Again, if we're not going to have a culture of comparison, we can't have a culture where we use our words to tear other people down. I'm purposely going to say things to you and about you that are going to hurt you. Now, I don't know if any of us wake up and go, you know what, I'm going to be like a person who criticizes people today. That's what I want to do. In fact, that's my contribution to the church is I want to be a critical person. That's what I want to do today. Why is this so important? Look at what Paul says in that verse one more time, verse 24. He said, God's put the whole body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Why? So that there should be no division in the body. That is why this is important. And I think that criticism can easily seep into our midst and therefore result in a church that isn't doing what God has called them to do because there is a sin that all of us are way too okay with in our midst. It's called gossip. You notice in our own lives we have like acceptable sins and unacceptable sins. I would never say that or I would never do that. Same thing can happen in the church collectively. And we don't walk up to someone and say, hey, if you have five minutes, I'd like to gossip with you about something. <laughs> no, it goes, hey, can we get coffee? I just want to pick your brain about this thing going on at church. If they're the thing that's going on at church, yeah, pick their brain. But if they're not, you're gossiping. You're not practicing Matthew 18. Hey, I just want your advice on this thing. How do I know I'm gossiping? When I'm talking with others about an issue I have with somebody else. Matthew 18 outlines a very clear way that we actually address things with other people. How we go to them one-on-one, -on -one, and if they do not listen, then we go to them with another brother or sister in Christ. If they don't listen again, then we get the church leadership or staff involved and come. And so, like, There's a process, but most of us, man, we just skip that first part. I'm just telling you, <clears throat> criticism will run rampant in our midst if we do not get a handle on the sin of gossip in all of our lives. I'm speaking to myself because I know that I can so easily, rather than go to a person I have a problem with or an issue with or have a frustration or whatever it might be, I can just so easily talk to other people around me. And you know what? When you talk to other people around you about the thing that you have a frustration or an issue with, you know what we're typically very good at? Not really painting the other side in the best light. Or another way to put that is someone's probably not going to walk away with our conversation thinking we've done anything wrong. We have to be a culture of critique where we're pushing and we're challenging. But we're not criticizing. And I want you to know just as a caveat, as a staff member, as a pastor and leader at this church, that is true of us as well. Our staff is held to this standard. If you ask our staff in staff meetings, what is the primary thing that will result in, if you want to call it a rebuke from our leadership, from even Pastor JJ, it's going to be this. <laughs> when we sense that there is gossip or there's criticism in our midst. Our staff is held to this standard. I would say, as another caveat, our staff is held to this standard not just by our own staff, but by you as well, meaning we have actually platforms and pathways for you. If you have frustrations with our church, with myself, Pastor JJ, anybody in our church, you actually have a way that you can reach out to us because we are held accountable. We have given our lives over and said, here we are, here's our decisions, here's how we think. Do with this what you will according to God's word. We can't ask you to do that if we would never actually do that ourselves. We have to be a place of critique, yes, but not criticism. 